Good morning, everybody. When uh, I started my Twitter account, I admit I had to look up on the help screen to find out what the hashtag was, because I could see other people tweeting their hashtag. I'm like, what is this animal? But uh, we all know technology is changing the way we work, and I, uh, the way we live, the way we interact. And what I really wanted uh, first is to start maybe with a little video to give you a sense and set the tone of what's happening. And then we're going to talk about how this affects payments. So pretty exciting stuff happening around the world. And what does it all mean to us? By the way, I can add my own little personal statistic. On text messaging, my daughter manages to send, she is uh, 14 years old, she can send about 75 text messages on average per day. That's the bill I get at the end of the month. But uh, I'm sure those of you who have teenagers can relate. You don't have conversations on uh, the dining room table anymore. You text them if you want them to hear you. So technology is changing how we live, is changing how we interact, is changing how we shop. And obviously, it's going to have a humongous impact on payments. And when Hugo and I talked about this presentation, we kind of wanted to step back a little bit and give you a bit of an overview of how this changes in technology is impacting how we pay and how the changes in payment can impact the way we do business in this conference. So we're going to talk about four main things. I'm going to talk a little bit about e-commerce and give you some statistics. We're going to talk about prepaid, which is also growing very fast. We'll talk about mobile, of course. You can't avoid mobile and m-commerce. And we will talk about social commerce which is uh, something I've, I'm growing to learn by the day. And uh, we'll look at what these means to our industry, what kind of opportunities or threat they create, and how we can be players. So talking a little bit about e-commerce, um, I mean, I, I don't need to tell you that it's, it's growing at a tremendous pace. You saw the numbers about internet penetration. And we're going to reach, can you hear me OK? Am I talking too fast for the translators? OK, pace it a little bit. So in 2010, e-commerce in the US was 150 billion. Uh, when retail, you know, mom and pop stores and big box retailers are growing about 2%, e-commerce shopping on the internet is growing about 10, 11%. On, during the holiday season, at the peak, retail grew 10, 8 to 10%, e-commerce grew 34%. So it's taking the world of shopping by storm and obviously the world of payment. Today, it's 8% of all retail sales, and it's expected it's going to be an incre increasing part of sales over time. And there's a lot of convenience to it. As you all know, you can comparison shop. You can shop from the comfort of your home. Um, uh, uh, during, uh, if you remember, the holiday season in the US is around Thanksgiving. They talk about Black Friday, where everybody goes to the shops and buys the Christmas gifts. There's also Cyber Monday, where everybody goes on the internet from work and waste their employer's time, but end up doing their shopping they couldn't do on Friday. 10% growth on Black Friday, 34% growth for e-commerce year over year on Cyber Monday. Uh, I have friends at Tiger Direct. Some of the stuff they shipped, shipped in January. They couldn't keep up. So it is exponentially growing. We're living in an exponential world. Uh, to look at Amazon, one of the biggest online retailers, Amazon grew 42% year over year the last quarter. And everybody thinks it's really U.S. driven. It used to be. U.S. used to be 70% of Amazon's sale. Now they're only 47%. Amazon ships about 4 million on their peak. They ship 4 million items to 200 countries on a given day. So it's becoming global commerce. And obviously with global e-commerce, there's opportunities for us who have been moving money around the world all this time. To give you some idea about numbers in, um, outside of the U.S., so China in 2009 was 44 billion. In 2010, e-commerce is 100 billion. Now, put things in perspective, the whole remittance world is estimated to be between 300 and 400 billion a year. So China alone in e-commerce is doing 100 billion, and they're growing at 34%. Brazil, 12 billion. And Brazil is growing at 18.8%. It's the number 13 country in the world in internet shopping. And it's the first in Latin America. But it's not only Brazil. Mexico now is estimated to be $5 billion 
in e-commerce. And that's growing. And you've got to imagine, these are countries where cash is still king. It's not Visa and MasterCard. And so you have the Boleto in Brazil. You have, there's a solution actually called Todito Cash in Mexico. People are finding ways, more and more ways to shop on the internet. And of course, prepaid is also helping in that. And there are global solutions for cashing and buying e-vouchers that uh, are becoming more and more available. So 90% of the world's transactions are still done in cash. People are finding more and more ways to shop online, even if they don't have credit cards, even if they don't bank. Remember, there's only 2 billion accounts, and there's 6.5 billion human beings around the world. So there are other ways to do business. And that creates for us a big opportunity. And we'll talk about this at the end of the presentation. Now, second was prepaid. We said we'll talk about prepaid. So prepaid obviously is being driven a lot by e-commerce. You know, you're in Bulgaria or you're in uh, Uruguay and you want to buy something over the internet. If you don't have another way, you go get a prepaid card. It rides on the Visa and the MasterCard system. You put your number, you pay, and you're done. Um, and that's really benefiting a lot of the prepaid card companies. U.S. still leads. U.S. is estimated to be 70% of the prepaid card market at about 200 billion, but this is changing. So it's expected to go down from 70% world market share to 53% by 2017. And there was a big research done by the Boston Consulting Group around prepaid that has those numbers. So it's gonna be global. And that creates an opportunity for us to play as well. Uh, the big countries that are expected to grow, of course, Western Europe, UK, Italy, France, etc. but India, Mexico, China, Brazil, a lot of Middle Eastern countries are having big growth in prepaid because banks there cannot extend credit. There's no credit history or credit scoring system, but prepaid cards are linked to your account. So they're putting prepaid cards in every hand they can. And they convert something that's a transactional value, one-time uh, shopping or one-time opportunity to make money off of a customer to a lifetime relationship and a lifetime value. So at the end, it's a very lucrative market. Uh, in the US, there's a lot of initiatives done by the two big cards companies to bring more people, especially the underbank. There's 200 billion worth of shopping around the world with the underbank, that's estimated. And so they want to get into that market. And for example, MasterCard has done a program with Univision to target the Hispanic market. Uh, they've done a program with TravelX where you can go and if you expect to travel, you can buy a prepaid card in the currency of the country you're going to. So they do a Forex and give you a prepaid card and so you can get an advantage, an advantageous exchange rate. You don't have to go and exchange at the hotel at a horrible rate. Uh, Social Security in the U.S. is putting their, their money on card. I know they're doing it as well in Mexico. Uh, Walmart is putting their payroll on prepaid cards. So more and more, this is going to become a large part of our lives. Um, MasterCard has a program called Repower. We know Green Dot. We know NetSpend. There's a lot of push also to have retail point of sales that can load cash onto those cards. And whether it's cards or e-wallets or m-wallets and everything we can talk about in a few minutes, that's an opportunity for us as well, looking at reload points, because we have a network. Thirdly is mobile commerce. Well, we'll start to understand mobile. I mean, it's a very compelling number. There's 5.1 billion cell phones around the world. There's 2 billion bank accounts again. So the opportunity to be able to bank unbanked people on a cell phone is huge. And you'll see it a lot in the developing world because it's a cash world. Uh, there's no remote branches in some villages. In, there's, uh, it doesn't pay to put a bank or an ATM. So there's been a lot of initiatives. You may have heard about uh, the initiative in, with Safaricom called M-Pesa in Kenya. It's expanded actually to most of South Africa. They have banked 12 million people where there was 2.5 million bank accounts in that country. And they've done it since 2007. That's when the project started. So in four years, they've been able to bank 12 million people. In the Philippines today, Globe and Smart, which are the two telecom operators, are the largest banks in the Philippines. They have more accounts on the cell phones than there are bank accounts in the Philippines. So it's a great way to reach people. It's a simple P2P transaction. They can do it on a barcode phone. You don't even need a smartphone. And there's a huge world demand for it. So it's still a very fragmented market. Uh, a lot of, uh, there's about, I'm tracking about 75 different mobile wallet companies that are trying to create mobile wallets around the world. And they don't talk to each other yet. So, but that's gonna change. So today, for example, all the, most of the Kenya transactions are inside Kenya, between those 12 million accounts. People go by at a store and move money, or they send money to each other. But Western Union is testing uh, between the UK and Kenya a solution 
where they can send money from a Vodafone through Western Union to Safaricom. There's a lot of other deaths happening. Uh, Ericsson is building a, uh, the equivalent of SWIFT for the mobile industry. They're trying to put a worldwide standard so all the different phone wallets can interact and start sending money to each other. And that's what's missing with the fragmentation. You don't have a standard, and you don't have a standard for security, which also worries people a little bit. But that's also changing very rapidly. And then you have, so in the US, it's mostly mobile banking. You connect to your bank account. There's no real strong demand because there's not a lot of cashed customers. The underbanked are about 27 million, and they find ways to bank with check cashing and, and a lot of our businesses that doesn't create this compelling demand. Still, 53% of, of the phones in the US are smartphones. So it enables people to do everything they want to do with their bank right on their smartphone. Very, two very different models, and we don't expect the US to change a lot from that perspective because the consumer need isn't as prevalent as it is in the developing world. However, if you look at um, acceptance of cards, so there's two ways you could look at, at the mobile transaction. Mobile as a payment device, so you initiate a payment, or mobile as an acceptance device where you can accept payment from other people. So probably you've heard about Foursquare uh, or Swipe. There's a lot of companies now that sell you a little Max Stripe reader that you can stick in your iPhone, and all of a sudden now you can use it to take transactions. So if you don't want to buy a POS machine and you already have your phone, it's a very cheap upgrade. Or if you are a plumber or a gardener and you go visit people at their house or you sell pizza, all you have is your phone and you can swipe it and take the transaction. So that is taken off. What's also taking off is NFC, near field communication. It's a small chip that they can put in a card or in a phone and you wave it at the location. It's much easier than swiping and it doesn't read. Um, it's also a little more secure. And uh, there's a lot of initiatives happening with mobile phones. Nokia is embedding in most of their phones now NFC chips. There are rumors that the iPhone 5 will have an NFC chip in it. There are companies now that sell NFC stickers that you can put in the back of your phone that will link to your card account. And there are micro SD cards that are also NFC enabled. So instead of being a memory card, you put it in any phone, and now you have a wallet. And what's really cool about it is it's a smart wallet. You can look at how much balance you have. You can use your phone to interact with your wallet when it's NFC that's connected to the phone. The big difficulty here is that you have to upgrade all the terminals in all the shops. So you know, many of you in the US have seen that you, could, you had the wave uh, little wand when you bought gas. A lot of gas station upgraded that. Transportation, the MTA in New York is upgrading all their terminals so they can accept NFC as well. Some stores are doing it. There was some tests done with McDonald's. There was some tests done with Jack in the Box. A lot of retailers where every second at the cashier counts are going to want to accelerate the process. Instead of pulling out a card, looking for which card you want to use, swiping it, 10 seconds are worth a lot of money to a Kroger or a Publix or a big supermarket chain or a big store. They want to shorten the line. So if it saves five seconds from the process, they want it. So mobile, in the, especially industrial country, is going to take off a lot that way, but then P2P will follow. P2P, if you remember, the first attempt was PayPal. PayPal started as a way for friends to share a dinner bill or to send money easily from each other. It didn't take off as well because it wasn't as convenient. You needed a PC, you had to boot a PC. You know, now mobile phone is very convenient. Instant on, you don't press too many buttons and the money goes. So that's gonna also change how we interact with each other. 